So today we're heading to tropical North Queensland, where AWC is leading a collaborative project to save one of Australia's rarest mammal species from extinction. The northern betong was once found from the wet tropics right through to central Queensland, but today only survives in two populations. And to hear all about the work that we're doing to monitor some of those last wild populations, I'm joined today by two special guests. The first is Dr. Manuela Fisher. Um, Manny, thanks for joining us. No worries. Manny's a wildlife ecologist and has been on the AWC team based in Cairns in the Northeast for two years. She did her master's on cheetahs uh, in Namibia and a PhD on swamp wallabies and human interactions on Phillip Island. We're also joined today by Johnny Murison, and Johnny is one of the Western Yalanji Rangers, and we're actually speaking to you from the Western Yalanji office in Mariba. So, Johnny, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, guys. Glad to be here. So, uh, Johnny and Manny have both been very closely involved in monitoring northern betongs. Manny, I thought to start with, it would be really good just for people who aren't familiar with this species to get an idea of what it looks like. Describe to us what a what a northern betong looks like. Yeah, so the northern betong is a really small marsupial. It's only about one kilogram of weight, and it has a grey fur and um, a really long tail that it can use to um, carry grass and twigs um, to build their little nests. Um, they live in in dry to wet sclerophyll. And they really like like tall eucalyptus trees and, and a casuarina, and um, they they need grassy understory to survive. And yeah, as jo Joey already said, there used to be four population historically historically in in this area, and now there's only two remaining populations in the wet tropics, and one of them is where I work. Yeah, so a, a really special little animal that's now very very restricted in range. And AWC actually works with a lot of different species of betong. So in the past, we've talked about uh, burrowing betongs, which are those, um, you know, the only burrowing member of the kangaroo family. Uh, Woylies or brush-tailed betongs, which again were, you know, previously very widespread, probably hundreds of millions when European people colonised Australia. Uh, but they went almost completely extinct from the mainland. Um, and the northern betong. So this is one that we hear less about, you know, possibly because it's it's so restricted. So you mentioned their habitat, and they're not living in rainforest, are they? It's a, a special uh, habitat adjacent to rainforest. What's that landscape like? Yeah, so it's um, dried up, it's careful, and like tall trees, open grassy understory. They feed on truffles and kakatukra, so they find these uh, resources in those areas, and that's why it's really important to keep that habitat the way it is, because these truffles and kakatukra can only thrive in those um, habitats. Right, and so truffles, that's a fairly uh, indulgent kind of menu for, for a betong. I wonder if, you know, being fussy with their food is one of the reasons that they've declined. Yeah, so we see a lot of damage um, caused by pigs, especially. Um, so pigs compete for resources such as truffles, so they dig up the soil, they get the truffles out of the ground, which first of all, then, you know, they can compete for the truffles, but then also it, it damages the habitat by all the digging. So that's a major threat of the northern betongs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. We'll, we'll come back and talk more about the threats in a, in a minute. Johnny, I'm, I'm really interested in the work that you do too as part of the Western Yalangi Rangers. Can you tell us about that ranger group and what kind of projects you're involved with? Yeah, so the, the Western Yalangi Rangers um, are not officially uh, established at this stage. Um, we are um, getting funding. Um, we've already gone through one round of uh, successful round, you know, uh, to get through to uh, the last and final round where we would be getting funded for the next five years. So this is just some of the work if that was successful that we would be able to put our resources and our um, human resources um, in on the ground to assist uh, AWC and um, supporting each other. Uh, it's, it's a device diversified um, uh, uh, job description and role. Uh, we're doing mine site inspections, uh, making sure miners are not going outside of their jurisdiction, their boundaries, their leases and um, whenever there's uh, cultural heritage like a scar tree or any occupational deposits that uh, that's recorded and, um, and uh, GPS 
um, and, um, and then put in exclusion zones uh, for those miners. Uh, there's a bit of fencing been going on out at Palmville Station. So uh, yeah, lots of, and um, even training um, tour guides in uh, at the ranges, some of the ranges in uh, Rock Art uh, tourism business. Um, so yeah, so it's diversified and, um, you know, obviously we got limited uh, time on ground uh, due to the wet season up here. They're always, always usually pretty hard and long. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. a lot of exciting work. And then also working with uh, yellow belly gliders up in that same mountain system as well. Yeah, cool. Okay, that sounds sounds really interesting. And, um, you know, best of luck with getting that ranger group officially, uh, you know, established, because I think there's a lot of scope for collaboration between AWC and the, the kind of work that, that you guys are Absolutely. doing. Mm. Um, I think you've also been involved in Northern Qual surveys with AWC, was that right? Previously, yes, there, there were some other rangers and um, individuals who went out and helped with that. You know, um, yeah, it's probably, you know, maybe a week's worth of work or something like that. But with the um, Northern Batons, um, I think we've been a bit more present um, yeah. and, um, and consistent in sending out um, our rangers. Yeah, it's, it's great to see. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Johnny. Uh, it's just, yeah, just something that we believe in and, yeah, we want to see this um, yeah, little marsupial uh, get back up and running again, you know? Yeah, well, that's that's something we all share, you know, the objective to it, to look after these animals that, that's, you know, in such small numbers now, but but hopefully there's a bright future for them if we can work together. Um, Manny, we, we actually had a conversation last year about the Northern Betong, but that was focused on a different part of this project. So for the last few years, we've been really looking at this species across its range. And last year, the discussion was about a translocation, which we plan to uh, Mount Zero Taravale, which is within that historical range. So that's continuing. Um, do you have an update from, from what's what that's up to at Mount Zero? Yeah, so we just got approved to build a fence, which is great news. So okay. um, now we just have to do a, a ground drizzing and get the um, permission from the from the um, traditional owners in the area. Right. Um, so hopefully the fence will be starting to get built soon. Um, and then the idea is, yeah, to translocate about 50 animals from the wild into the fenced area, which will be great to get a, another publication, a pu another <laughs> population going down there as like a, a little safe heaven for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think with species like this, when it gets to such low numbers, only in two sites, um, establishing new populations is a really important part of, of making sure they survive. Yeah. Especially because they used to be at Mount Zero Terrible. So it's good to get the population back down there where they used to occur in the past. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that, that's a really exciting project. And I'll just uh, plug our latest magazine, Wildlife Matters. Um, if you haven't picked that up yet, we've actually got a really good article on that Northern Betong work covering not just the monitoring, but also the translocation. But today I'd like to talk more about the monitoring of the wild populations that you've been doing. There are actually two surviving populations, as we've mentioned. Um, have you been working with both of those or focusing on, on just one? Yeah, I've been working with both of them, um, but yeah, my project is particularly focusing on the smaller one. Um, so there's the one, the land branch, which has up to about a thousand individuals, and the one um, Johnny and I are working at, they have only probably about a hundred left, even less, because potentially, yeah. All right, and just to orient people, a bit of a blurry map here, but um, this is in the area close to Port Douglas, so people might be familiar with that, north of Cairns. And the coastal area there, you know, the Daintree uh, and all of that area is, is famous for its wet tropical rainforests. But as you said, this is the area kind of west of that band of rainforest in that transition zone into the drier country. Can you just point out to us where that, that population is that you're working with? So you can see Port Douglas in the middle. And then if you go to the west, you have Mount Spurgeon and Mount Lewis, and that's where the population is. Right. And as far as we know, in that smaller population, how many animals do we think are, are left on the ground there? Yeah, so we think there's less than 100. So we have done a preliminary data analysis based on our service that we're doing, and it's somewhere between probably like 30, 40, up to 70, 80. Right. That's that's really dire straits for a population to get into sort of <clears throat> double digits, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's quite devastating to see that there's only only a small amount left in that area. 
And so for this project, monitoring this population, there's a number of different techniques you can use, uh, which we'll, we'll come to in a minute. But what are the objectives overall? So what are we trying to find out about these animals? Well, so the first thing we want to find out, obviously, is how many are actually there. So no one really knew until recently. It was only like a broad guesstimate of like how many are there. So we've, we've done a lot of surveys focusing on the population estimate and then also the distribution of the animal. Um, then also we want to look at what habitat they use, where they move around, what their movement looks like um, to get an idea of what habitat they prefer and where might there might be some threats. And yeah, the, the other objective is threats. So we're looking at threats such as cattle, cat, pigs, mm. lantana, and the station, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the, the same old story is, you know, um, fire management, feral animals, weeds, all of these things have an impact on, on populations of native species. And it, it sounds like they're all interacting too. So we might talk about that a little later. Um, Johnny, you were up on one of the surveys last year, I think it was. What was that trip like and uh, what techniques were you using to, to monitor the betongs that time? Yeah, so um, yeah, it was a privilege to be a part of the team and, and assist uh, AWC on behalf of uh, Western Yalangi and um, just to scope out the works and what they're up to. And um, besides, you know, being a good bunch of people and, you know, sitting around a campfire every night and having good feeds, um, getting out on the ground and setting camera traps, um, um, that was already, um, you know, pre pre planned in certain areas. Um, you know, over a big sparse of country, you know, like flat areas and then then hilly parts as well. So um, and real steep, uh, rugged country. And um, yeah, so we had to set these camera traps and set the bait and yeah, see see what numbers were out there. And yeah, and Manny will be able to tell you what some of those uh, results might have been. But um, you know, I took my daughter along, and um, you know, being our country, it's um, yeah, really important for us to. Um, she was only nine, but it's just important for her to be involved in all aspects of country, you know, um, not just the, the good stuff, but, you know, to see what else we can do to help our, our native uh, wildlife population out there. So yeah. for us, yeah, it, was a, it was a privilege to be out there and, um, and to assist and, and, um, and to come back and tell all the elders about it and, um, and get their support behind the project as well, you know. Yeah, fantastic. And it, it's great to see your daughter getting involved. We've actually got a message from your daughter, which we might play uh, a little later on, uh, maybe at the end to finish up today. Uh, but it sounds like she was really enthusiastic about the work too. She was, um, you know, especially missing school. That was great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, you mentioned camera trapping was one of the techniques. So Manny, with camera traps, is there a certain way of uh, laying out the the array so that you're collecting a certain sort of data or do you just blanket the area in as many as possible? How, how do you arrange that? No, so we set cameras based on um, previous knowledge of knowing where they are and where they like to hang out. And then we wanted to really get focused on like one small area that we intensively monitor. So we set up a camera grid. So you can see um, about 100 cameras in this grid and shown in the stars. And they're 250 meters space. So you get a really good idea of how many animals are there if you run this over and over again. So we're doing this every six months. We put these cameras out for about four weeks. And so we get ideas also of like seasonal changes because we do it in the end of the dry and the end of the wet season. And yeah, they show up on the cameras and then you can do some magical statistics and um, that spits you out an idea of how many animals are there per square kilometer. Great. And um, I think it's it's good actually for our supporters to know too that, you know, one of these camera traps might be $700 or $800 with the batteries, it's it's closer to a thousand dollars to actually pay for one of these motion sensor cameras. How many did you say you're working with across this project? So that's a hundred in that grid. Right. So a grid of a hundred cameras, and that just goes to show how significant our investment in these threatened species is. That's you know, it's a lot of resources going onto the ground to find out about this really critical uh, remaining population of northern betongs. So you know, if you're making a donation to AWC this is the kind of project that you're supporting that's you know it's real science on the ground so with camera traps of course there's a scent attractant so it's it's kind of like a bait but something that they can't actually get to so it's in a little canister and that means you pick up all sorts of other 
non-target species as well, doesn't it? So yeah. I've got some of these photos here. Do you just want to uh, tell us some of the other species that you've been picking up? Yeah, so that's a long nose bandicoot there. And there's heaps of them around. Um, we get all sorts of um, cool stuff that's an elephant and cool. Um, we got black footed tree, right? We even got a bat once. Um, oh, wow. And so these are all things that are, are drawn into that scent. Is that right? Yeah, so the, the bait is made up from um, <laughs> made up from peanut butter, which everyone obviously loves, oat, vanilla essence, and um, sardines to attract carnivores like the northern quoll or the spot tail quolls. And then um, specifically targeting the betongs, we put some truffle oil in there. So really expensive stuff. Wow. Um, and yeah, as you said, they're in a little canister so they can't actually get onto the bait. Um, so the scent is just in the area, they come to the bait, but they can't get into it. So the scent stays in the area for the four, four, <laughs> four weeks. Um, that's a, a brush there for some there. Right. So the, the truffle oil is obviously the best tucker that's been going there for a while to be getting all these animals coming into it. Yeah. Couple more brush tail possums with little Joey. Yeah, possums. Um, yeah. And then this one's good to see. What, what's that? Yeah, that's a dingo. So I see dingoes quite regularly in the area, even like running around during the day and night. Um, yeah, there's lots of dingoes up there and um, it's good to see, see them in the area. Johnny, did you have a, a local name for dingoes? Uh, we, we call, um, in our language, Western Yalanji, we call them murumu. Right. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so, so lots of non-target species there. Um, but you did also obviously record some northern betong. So um, I've got one here of, well, a couple of things actually, northern betong coming face to face with a brush tail possum. Do you see a lot of those sort of interactions on the camera traps? Um, not so much. That one is a rare one. You do get them occasionally, um, but yeah, it's nice to see that they're both in the same area. Hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Okay, so, so camera trapping is one method of working out the numbers. And you said using that grid every six months, you'll be able to get good data consistently over, over a period of time. Um, but then to get more detailed data about how individuals move around, uh, you have to use different techniques. So what else do you use? We also do cage trapping. So um, we set up 50 cages in the same area as the um, camera traps. And the advantage of cage trapping is, first of all, you can um, microchip the animal. So you ID them because on the camera, every animal looks like the same. You don't know if it's a new individual or the same one coming in every night. Um, with the cage trapping, we can, first of all, ID them. Um, we get an idea of their house because we weigh them, we measure them. And um, we also get some samples like tissue and hair samples to do DNA anal analysis. And the other thing is uh, they get a little GPS collar so we can track their movement. Yeah, okay, and we might just talk a bit about the, the GPS tracking. It's it's something that comes up often. It's you know a technique that we use for uh, lots of different species, especially in our reintroduction projects. Um, but for animals like this, it's, I assume, the first time that such detailed work has been done on their movements, is that right? Uh, yeah, I think there has been done a little bit of work, like you can get movement out of camera traps and stuff as well. But um, yeah, if you put a collar in, and this, these collars collect data every 20 minutes during their high activity time, which is from, you know, once the sun gets down until it comes up again, so from dusk till dawn. Um, so yeah, every 20 minutes, we know exactly where the animal is, where it moves around and what it's doing really. So. Right, and some of these images are just showing that that collar being fitted. So it's quite a small module with a, a transmitter. Uh, and then to actually collect that data, do you need to be on the ground close to the animal or is it transmitted by satellite? So these are, um, they collect data and store it on the device. And I can get in there, if I get close enough to the animal, I can download it remotely, but they're so trap happy. So you get them easily in the trap. So what I do is usually just go back in about six weeks time or eight weeks time, and then um, catch the animal again, take the collar off, plug it into my computer and download the data. Yeah, okay. They're, they're um, truffle oil tragics. So um, yeah. <laughs> okay, right. And this is actually the, the radio receiver that you can use to find the animal. So some of them have GPS plus a radio transmitter, I guess. Yeah, so they have a radio transmitter, and then I can just see where they are um, while I'm up there as well. Okay, cool. And 
the data that you get from this kind of GPS tracking, it's, it's high resolution, so you can see to within a few meters accuracy how the animals are moving around. And yeah. I'm just going to share a map from this study area that shows the movement of a few different individuals. Um, so on these maps, let's just talk through. So the, the yellow dots here are camera traps, is that right? Yep. So there's 50. Oh, sorry, they're not, these are the cage traps. Oh, cage traps. Okay. So that's that's where we're live trapping the animals. Yep. And then each of the different colours of the small dots connected by lines are an individual northern betong. So there's one in green, one in blue, and one in purple. What does mm -hmm. this movement tell you about how these animals are moving around? So yeah, it's quite interesting. I can get an idea of what their home range is. So how far do they move around? Um, if you put all points into one part, really, and then um, you can look at the fine scale stuff. Like you can see the green and the blue one, for example, they pretty much use exactly the same area, which is interesting. So something must be there that attracts them to their, their area. And so you can go in there, grand is what's happening. And you know, you do like a, a detailed vegetation habitat um survey and see what's actually there the um lilac one is a really good example of threat so i've been in there i was like what's going on there why is there such a gap in the middle you know why yeah. is it so clustered on the left and the right and then there's nothing so i went in there um last year with my partner and we just had a little bit of a hike around and it was highly lantana infested so there's a lot of lantana in that area so it's obviously not very suitable habitat for the animal but it must be like some truffle sauces or cockatoo grass in those spots where it likes to hang out. That's really interesting. So you're getting a, an actual picture that it's almost like the betongs are mapping out the threats for you because we know lantana changes the habitat structure and here's evidence of them, you know, avoiding that big infestation. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. So what are what are the other threats then? If you know we talked about habitat structure being one of them, they need that open kind of grassy understory to access truffles and and the tubers on cockatoo grass. Um, what are the other threats that we know facing the last populations of this species? So yeah, I've mentioned the pigs, and um, the same occurs for cattle. So cattle also feeds on grass, and you know damages the, the ground. So wherever there's a lot of cattle around, there's less betongs. Um, and so their grazing behavior, it's just, it's just really struggling getting the grass and the resources back for the betong. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, Lantana is taking over a lot of the landscape up there. So that's obviously a big threat because um, nothing else really grows under the Lantana thickness. And lack of fires. So, um, Good fire management helps revegetation, revegetating the, the habitat and the vegetation and brings the truffle back, brings the cockatoo grass back, opens up the landscape and um, creates new habitat. I guess Johnny can talk more about fire because I don't know much about it, but yeah. Sure, yeah. These, these guys have done a lot of fire, fire management in other areas, I guess. Sure, yeah, Johnny, do you want to tell us about that? So um, <laughs> is, is fire management a big part of what the rangers do and, and what's some of the work you've been involved in on that side of things? Yeah, the last couple of years, um, the fire management has been part of the the um, the, the uh, work calendar and, um, and, the, and the yearly calendar. So um, uh, we would definitely would love to be involved, um, you know, working with parks and AWC um, to help manage uh, the landscape and, bring it back to its former glory. And that's what fire management is now. And um, it's what we do because, you know, there's so much pests, you know, hyptis, um, greater grass and that thatch grass, you know, um, in, right across our country, it's just brings a tear to your eye to see, um, you know, what's happening to the landscape with the winds that blow and um, just spreading that seed around. And so we, we know that country is sick and the only way to uh, bring it back uh, to its former glory is through fire. So we will definitely be a part of that and love to be a part of it. And if we all can work together in that, throw all our resources and uh, skills and our, put our thinking caps on together, um, yeah. I think that you know, we could uh, achieve good outcomes. Fantastic. Yeah, looking forward to it. And um, we've done bits of that. If you, if you trial uh, kind of plots at Mount Zero Tara Vale with trying to get that grassy understory revitalised again, and, you know, part of that is thinning out the mid-story, so removing lantana or casserina or, or even rainforest plants. 
to let the sunshine in basically because it's all connected you know if you remove the weeds the sun comes in the grass is able to grow again um, and that revitalizes that that ground story which is where the the beton gets all of its food resources cool okay well um before long we'll come to some questions but um, Manny, we've talked about those threats. We've talked about monitoring this last population and how you know establishing a new population at Mount Zero Taravel is a, a really high priority for AWC and our partners. Um, I'm interested in what's being done to actually deal with those threats on the ground at these sites. Yeah, so Parks and Wildlife, um, they have actually built a blockage fence for, uh, for cattle on the western boundary of the national park. So that's been done last year in October. And the whole idea of this project um, is to monitor the, the northern battles and the threats before and after that fence was built. So um, we done a lot of surveys last year and now hopefully um, the cattle will be mustered out of the area at some point soon. And then we can get an idea of the after effects of removing cattle from the country. So hopefully everything comes back a little bit more and um, yeah, it will be good to see what's, what's happening. Very good. Um, now, there's a couple more things I'd like to share with you. And one is a, a river crossing. So this is to, to give people some idea of the conditions that you're working in. And this is after a, a very big wet season in, uh, in Northern Australia. So Queensland actually had an extended wet season that's carried on up until the last few weeks, really. So um, where was this, this bit taken, Manny? And can you just talk us through what's going on here? Yeah, so it takes about three hours from Cairns to get into the site. The last hour is a um, really steep and challenging four-wheel drive track, and it includes the the crossing of the McLeod River. So this is um, the river crossing. This is just like 20 minutes away from where we came for the surveys. Um, so yeah, that's the, the last hurdle before you get into the study site. And oh. yeah, the river, the river was particularly high that day because it's been raining the week before, like nonstop. Wow. And was that this year? Yeah, that's just a few weeks ago. That was in April. Wow. Incredible um, to get that sort of water at this time of year. It's good yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Okay. Um, all right. We might come to some questions now. So if, if you do have questions that have come up, uh, please type them into the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll deal with as many as we can. But um, I'll just remind you too that we've got a really comprehensive article about this in our magazine, Wildlife Matters. Um, and you can find that on our website as well, australianwildlife.org. Um, so the, the current edition just out has a numbat on the front and lots of good information about our projects all around Australia, including this Northern Betong work. We'll also be telling you a lot more about the Northern Betong translocation over the coming months. So as the, the fence construction kicks off um, and as we prepare for actually moving the animals, which might be late this year or early next year, we'll have a lot more updates on that. So today we'll focus more about the, the monitoring of these wild populations. Um, Manny, we've had a question here about uh, attaching the collars, so the GPS collars to these animals. Is that a, a challenging thing to do? Um, I know you've got experience collaring much bigger and more ferocious animals like cheetahs. Um, so I guess a, a beton is fairly straightforward, but but what's involved there? It's so much harder to call a beton than a cheetah. <laughs> really? <laughs> it is. A cheetah is asleep, does nothing, and you just put it around. It's really big, big neck. You know what you're doing. With a beton, they can jump. You have to hold it really firm. It's so fiddly and tiny. You just sit there oh. and put it on. They bite you as well if you know, if you don't look at. <laughs> so yeah. Honestly, it's probably the most challenging GPS track I've ever deployed on an animal. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, so it's so it's quite small. And it's um, do you need to catch the animals again to remove it? Yeah, so I, I go out again and catch them and put okay. it. Okay. Yeah, it's just a cable tie that holds it together, so you just clip it off. Okay, perfect. Um, some questions here about feral animals. So in this area, you know. Part of it is national park, part of this habitat, but there are still feral animals in, in some of these areas. And we know that you know, pigs and cattle are pretty much pervasive across uh, this part of Northern Australia. Um, and you talked about work to try and destock that area or remove those feral cattle. What about pigs? Is there anything that can be done to reduce the numbers there? 
Yeah, certainly. So um, there's definitely ways of getting rid of pixels out through shooting or, you know, yeah, parks is hopefully onto that as well. Um, so that'd be good because they seem to be digging up a lot of the areas and, and really threatening the beton in the area. Mm. Yeah, so you know, I guess it's a, a really challenging problem to deal with feral animals in such a in such rugged terrain because this is very you know it's very steep, mountainous, lots of it. Um, so I think strategic fencing will be key to that, and then just ongoing control to try and you know reduce that pressure in the landscape. Um, and then cats are something that we didn't talk much about, but we know that they're you know feral predators that have a really big impact on species like bettongs. Um, is that is there direct control that can be done or is it more about managing the landscape? Yeah, there is definitely direct control that can be done, like catching tra uh, cats in, in traps. Um, we have monitored cats up there a fair bit and they don't seem to be a lot around. So in the la last survey, we only picked up one cat, which is incredible. Um, so they don't seem to be a huge threat to betongs in the area, same for the lane branch. There's not all that many cats. So we know they predate on northern betongs, but apparently there's not that many around. So we're not too concerned about cats at the moment, but there's definitely ways of um, catching and, and removing cats through, through active trapping and shooting. Well, that's, that's good to hear that they seem not to pose such a big threat. Um, and we know that there's there's also the the rufous betong in some of these areas, and they seem to have survived okay, maybe because they're a bit bigger, but um, maybe it's also just less specialised habitat. A lot of people interested in the the fire management work that you've been doing, Johnny. Um, do you want to tell us anything more about that? What what techniques you use? Is it drip torch and ground based burning, or is it uh, you know from a helicopter? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, a bit of both. Um, well, because the uh, the country that we're in. Um, where we've been burning is called uh, Wul Wulbajulba, Mama Land Trust. So it's all, um, you know, it's got native title um, as one layer and then land trust on top of that. But the country where we burn, it's all sandstone conglomerates. So good luck getting on the ground up through that country. So we need, um, we need chopper and, um, and uh, to just keep our boundaries um, safe from other uh, pastoral station landholders. Um, yeah, we need to uh, burn along the western side of that boundary, which is the uh, Laura Maytown Coast Road. But we're joining up with uh, another pastoral station called uh, Palmerville. And um, yeah, and so hopefully we'll be able to um, join forces next year. And, um, and we're all registered with the clean energy regulators. And um, yeah, we'll be doing fire workshops on country this year. And um, yeah, and sharing how we do country and how we burn country and how we read country from parent tree country to mixed country and um where we know it'll stop where we know it'll keep going and yeah but obviously uh we burn it full time on, on that particular type of country yeah but uh it seems like uh up at uh, mount lewis virgin that we're going to need to yeah um um pull up our sleeves and and uh do some hot burns up there to get rid of that lantana yeah, that's right. And yeah, we've, we've talked about fire before, but it can be used for so many different applications. You know, weed control in this case um, is one. We know that you can get rid of lantana if you if you blast it with a hot enough fire. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really diverse tool, I guess, a versatile tool. Um, Johnny, someone else is asking if there is a Western Yalangi name for betongs in particular. Yeah, good question. I, I'd have to check um yeah i haven't um come across it but give me a couple of seconds i might be able to find it okay, um, sure. <laughs> but um but I, at the top of my head i don't know hmm. yeah no worries um a really interesting question here manny about the genetics so you, you said that you're getting tissue samples from animals as you catch them in this wild population um how far have we got with as, or analyzing the genetics of that species and, and how does that inform what we're doing with them? Yeah, there has been a fair bit of genetic work done on the species. So we give these samples away to external researchers. Um, so we know that they're um, quite distinct from the lamb range, the other population. And they, we also know that they keep um, certain alleles that they don't have in the other population. Right. And does that affect what we're doing with the, the translocation or with the you know, with working with these wild populations? 
Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion around whether or not we need to preserve these um, unique alleles in the um, in the population that the small population um, and get animals out of of there into the fence area. Um, possibly not going to happen because the population is so small that it's too risky to um, take animals out of the wild. Another solution might be the other way around so that we take animals out of the fence area or the land range area and put them into it the um, carbon turbulence population. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. I think more and more we're turning to genetics to inform uh, how we manage whole populations. So, you know, in this case, we're working across two different sites, plus trying to establish a third site for northern betons. Um, but making sure we've got a healthy genetic diversity in that founder population is a critical part of it. So um, we'll definitely talk more about that in the future and you know AWC is pouring a lot of resources into that genetic work to support our translocations and, and reintroductions now. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up pretty soon but a couple more things I want to let you know about. One is that as we head towards the end of the financial year AWC is currently running a matching challenge. So thanks to the generosity of three AWC supporters um, the details are on the screen here of the $3 million matching challenge, which is currently active. What it means is that for any donations you make, gifts over $500 will be matched uh, according to the terms set out on the screen there. So if you're interested in supporting AWC, please log on to australianwildlife.org and make a donation there or get in touch with one of our staff. Uh, the, the details for that are on our website as well. Um, all of your support is really valued and we couldn't do any of this work with threatened species without you. So um, I hope you've been inspired by this work that we've been talking about today and will consider making a donation. Um, I thought it would be nice today to finish off with a message from your daughter, Johnny. Um, do you want to tell us about your daughter and, and how she came out on the, the Betong monitoring trip last year? Yeah, look, you know, I just want to teach my kids um yeah a lot about country and um not just bush taka bush medicine but the important work you know um you yeah, use a lot of traditional knowledge and western science combine all together so um yeah i just wanted to experience this and um help be a part of a big picture of saving you know uh, uh, possibly endangered species and um yeah anyway so uh, she had a great time and when i did share with her what she's involved with you know she had a grin from ear to ear and yeah, uh, so she, was, she just realised she was really a part of something important and big. And, of course, being on country camping, you know, she couldn't complain. Hi, my name is Ali. Naku Wangadare Yalanji Jalbu. I am a Western Yalanji girl. Last year, I went on a camera trapping expedition with AWC and my dad. It made me so sad to hear the little northern batons are nearly extinct. Because of their habitat loss, encroaching rainforest lantern and feral animals. Because of these things, there are hardly any northern batons left. They are so cute, we should do everything we can to save them. They are important to our country. I would love to go up again this year, even if I have to miss school. I love walking through the bush to look for them. Well, what better way to leave it than that? Um, they are so cute. We should do everything we can to save them. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Manny and Johnny uh, from Mariba. Pleasure. See you guys. Thanks very much. And to everyone else, I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. Um, we'll share the recording on our website, australianwildlife.org. Uh, get in touch for more information. You can read more in our magazine, Wildlife Matters, and I'll see you next week. Thanks.